Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life where we talk everything true crime. I want to apologize in advance if my voice sounds a bit hoarse during this video. I'm a bit under the weather, but you know I had to come on here and like crank out this update for you guys because so many of you guys have been asking for not only me to cover it, but for my opinion on this case. So I'm gonna be here. I'm probably gonna like have to cough in between, but just like bear with me as we go. And before we get started, don't forget to do your thing to support the channel by hitting that like button and hitting that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. It's totally free to subscribe and it's an easy way to support the channel. Uh, but all of you tend to lifers know that and you're already subscribed and I love you and I'm so happy to have you guys back with me today. Today's case is a current case that is extremely angering and sad all in one. It's one based out of Centerville, Texas. Centerville is an extremely small town right in between Dallas and Houston. The population is slightly under 1,000 people, so it is a very tight-knit community, one where everybody knows everyone. Well, on June 2nd, just earlier this month, Mark Collins and his four grandsons, Waylon, Carson, Hudson, and Bryson, were found dead on their family ranch that was also being used as a vacation home. And the person responsible? Well, it was a Texas prison escapee who was later shot dead in a shootout with police. But first of all, how did this inmate escape? Why did he kill this family? And most importantly, could this have been prevented? So let's break it down and go over everything that we know so far. Tend to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. We are taking a quick break in today's case to have a word from today's sponsor, Care Of. Care Of is a subscription service that ships high quality, personalized vitamins directly to your door every month. Personalized vitamins? How do they do that, you may ask? Well, let me break it down for you. You start by taking a super quick and in-depth quiz about your health goals, areas you wanna focus on, and then boom, you get personalized recommendations based on your answers, which is just so helpful and really eliminates that confusion around finding what works best for you and starting a new routine. I keep my personalized vitamin packs right on my nightstand so I can take them every morning without forgetting. And these daily vitamin packs are made of compostable film so you can feel good not only about what you're putting into your body, but also your impact on the planet as a whole. Bonus, I also use the Chia Flax Powder as a mix-in with my drink, which really helps with my digestion. And what I love about Care Of is that you have visibility to everything that they recommend for you. Alongside the products that you get, they send you a card with the total detailed breakdown of everything that is included in your assorted vitamin pack. And knowledge is key, my friends. Knowledge is key. I've been taking Care Of for a couple of months now, and I'm already seeing results. Some of my main goals were to reduce stress, increase my mood, and get my gut in check because guys, it is not the best. And I'm already feeling so much better. I'm more easygoing, I'm happier, while also being physically comfortable given my digestive issues. Care of provides personalized guidance, quality products, and tools to not only help you build your healthy habit, but also to measure your progress so that you can feel confident that your routine is actually doing something. They really just make it so easy for you from start to finish. Unlike when I try to go rogue and do my own research and try out new supplements and vitamins, mm -mm, Care Of is handling it all for you. They do all of that work for you and they personalize it just for you. Take Care Of's quiz to find out what's recommended for you. Then use my code 10 to life for 50% off your first order. Guys, it is a game changer. You are going to love it. Thank me later and thank you, Care Of, for making me so much happier, so much more comfortable, and of course, for being such an incredible sponsor of the 10 to Life channel. And thank you to all of you viewers for understanding that sponsors are essential if we want to grow this channel to a place where I can give you more true crime all the time. Now let's jump back into today's case. Gonzalo Lopez was reportedly a Mexican mafia member, serving two life sentences in the state of Texas. He had a very long rap sheet in the U.S., which started all the way back in 1996, when he was convicted of two counts of aggravated assault and was sentenced to eight years in a Texas state prison. In 2004, he and an accomplice got into a shootout with Texas deputies while he was on his way to kill someone at the orders of one of the biggest drug cartels. 
The shootout originally started as a police chase, but quickly escalated. As they were in this police chase with these deputies, Gonzalo was holding onto the steering wheel while his accomplice, Luis, shot out at the deputy. Then, once their car ran out of gas, he jumped out on foot and took off running. The next day, he got a hold of a cartel associate who picked him up and helped him flee to Mexico. But as we know, criminals just keep on criminaling. I don't know if that's a word, guys. Is it a word? It is now. And Gonzalo came back to the U.S. to do just that, to keep on criminaling. In March 2005, Gonzalo made a deal with the La Mena drug cartel to kidnap a man in Texas because he owed the cartel over $40,000. But Gonzalo didn't act alone in this. He once again had an accomplice. So he and his accomplice kidnapped this man named Lupe Ramirez and hogtied him. They essentially created a ransom for the $40,000 that he owed the cartel, and then they left him there as they went to go pick up this money and pick up marijuana that apparently Lupe's family had left for them as payment. So they get the money, so you would think that they would now let Lupe go, right? The debt has been paid, the ransom has been met, time to let this guy go. Well, wrong. They didn't stop there. Gonzalo killed Lupe with a pickaxe and then buried his body in the desert. The law quickly caught up to him, however, and the next month he was arrested for drug charges. And after being arrested, he told a Texas ranger that he was the one responsible for the whereabouts of Lupe. And it's unclear why he did this. I And I'm pretty stumped here because I'm wondering, was he proud and he wanted the notoriety of the crime or were people now after him for some reason? and he wanted to secure his place in prison for safety, so he wanted to extend his sentence. Who knows what the reasons are, but in any event, he led law enforcement to the desert, and sure enough, Lupe was there, four feet underground. His hands were tied together, and the rope also covered his mouth and neck. So, Gonzalo was charged with capital murder and was also charged with attempted murder for that shootout incident that had happened a year prior. He was ordered to serve a life sentence for the murder that took place in 2006 and another for the attempted murder during the deputy shooting back in 2004. And this is where those two life sentences come into play. So now Gonzalo, facing the rest of his life in prison, was being housed in the Hughes unit in Gatesville, Texas. And the Hughes unit is a maximum security prison. And if you know anything about prisons or you know, lighter prisons. I forget what the word is called. I'm sick, guys. My mind is clouded. My head is clouded. But there's the um, maximum security, and then there's the one where it's like people joke around like it's like the country club or something. But, um, and that's where like, you know, Martha Stewart goes or somebody who's somebody. So he was in this maximum security prison because of all of his offenses and my guess because of his ties to the cartel, just knowing that this is a dangerous man. But on May 12th, 2022, he was transferred to the Estelle unit in Huntsville, Texas. Now the Estelle unit is also a maximum security prison, but it also has a hospital attached to it. And Gonzalo was being transferred there for a medical appointment. The two prisons are about 168 miles from each other and it's just under a three hour drive. So Gonzalo was put on the bus with 15 other inmates also being transferred, but he was put in a completely separate cage for high-risk inmates. But Gonzalo had a secret. He actually had no intention of going to any medical appointment at that hospital. And in fact, he had a plan all along to escape. So he started telling the other inmates in this bus that there was this opportunity for them to escape also and they could all flee. And he convinced them to help him out by basically jumping, shouting, and just really creating a total ruckus on the bus. Now this totally reminds me of a scene out of the movie Con Air. And if you haven't seen that movie, go do yourself a favor and watch it. I'm sure it's on Netflix. I don't know. I'm sure it is. But do yourself a favor. Basically, it's like a gem of a movie and Nicolas Cage is in it. So it's like cheesy, but good. It's hard to actually pinpoint if it's like a cult classic or if it's actually a good movie. I personally like it and I've seen it like 10 times, probably even more. But basically, they are on a prison airplane and do the exact same thing. They create chaos to cause distractions to ultimately overpower an officer, get the keys, and then, of course, ultimately escape. So when Gonzalo and the inmates did that, it distracted the officers enough that Gonzalo was able to get out of his hand and leg restraints that he was in, in this cage, cut through the expanded metal, and literally crawl out from underneath the cage on his stomach on the floor. 
and this monster was now free to do whatever he wanted. So once he was free, he went up and stabbed the bus driver. Gonzalo and the bus driver then get off the bus, and another officer comes from the back of the bus to help out the bus driver and see what the heck is going on. But then Gonzalo seized that opportunity, got back onto the bus, and drove it off by himself with all of the other inmates in the back, leaving that bus driver behind with wounds in his chest and his hand. It was like a scene out of a Western movie without the horses, I guess. I don't know. Or like a prison break episode. I don't even know. It's just like nuts. You can't make this kind of thing up. Unless, of course, you're Nick Cage and Conair. I don't know. So, of course, officers were not about to let him go that easy. But at the same time, they also didn't seem very prepared for something this crazy to go down and how to handle it. So they shot the back tire of the bus to disable it and stop it, which I guess must have freaked Gonzalo out because he then hopped off the bus and ran into the woods. And a fourth grade child actually caught this on cell phone footage. I saw the inmate. Oh my God. That small white speck trailing off into a field of green is believed to be him. 46-year-old prison inmate Gonzalo Lopez running away in his white TDCJ jumpsuit minutes after the prison bus crashed. He's in the woods. In the video, the driver shouts to an officer from a nearby police department responding to the crash, telling him what they'd just seen. He ran towards the house. You think? Yeah, somewhere near that house. So I was in that house might want to be careful. But the next day, May 13th, Gonzalo was immediately placed on the 10 most wanted list. This guy was clearly very, very dangerous, so everybody was on high alert. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Marnie Hughes. We start with some breaking news out of Texas. Another fugitive is on the run. A murder so, murderer so dangerous that just within the last few hours, authorities have added him to the state's top 10 most wanted fugitives list. His name is Gonzalo Lopez. He is serving a life sentence for capital murder and attempted capital murder. Authorities say he assaulted a corrections officer on a bus that was transporting prisoners yesterday, crashed that bus, and then he got away. Authorities are warning people in that area tonight, lock your doors, lock your cars, and stay inside. Some schools even went on lockdown within the last few hours. Senior National Correspondent Brian Nenton joining us live in Centerville, Texas, tonight with the latest on this manhunt. Brian. Marnie, this is especially disturbing because this man is so dangerous and because there have been no sightings of him up until now. So many questions about how this could have happened. We are told that he was shackled at his feet and he also had handcuffs on. He somehow managed to get out of both of those. He used some kind of tool to break into the cage where the driver was and managed to take over the bus. The search for Gonzalo Lopez continues. In Centerville, Texas, all eyes are on the woods just west of Interstate 75. Well, 13 cars, helicopter, horses, dogs. Sometimes there's been two, 300 people right here. Seamus Cavanaugh has been watching since this all began Thursday afternoon. He says he figures with this many law enforcement out, Centerville is the safest place in Texas right now. In all, more than 300 law enforcement officers have swarmed this area, and there is now a $15,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of Gonzalo Lopez. This man is a very dangerous person. If you see him, do not attempt to take him into custody by yourself, contact 911, have local law enforcement deal with him. He is someone not to be reckoned with by yourself. So why are they so concerned about Lopez? Well, not only did he overpower two guards in yesterday's escape, his rap sheet includes several extremely violent attacks. He has a capital murder conviction out of Hidalgo County. He also has an attempted capital murder conviction out of Webb County. He killed a man in 2005 with a pickaxe after kidnapping the man and asking for a ransom for his return. Of course, the biggest question now is where is the fugitive? But as the investigation into what happened continues, there are other tough questions the Department of Criminal Justice must answer. Can you describe the restraints that he had on in the bus? Was he shackled? And how is it possible that he was able to get out of those? He was wearing handcuffs. He had handcuffs, the leg restraints also. Uh, how he got out of them, we do not know. So he got out of the handcuffs and the leg restraints? Yeah, he got up into the driver's compartment. Do you, are you aware of what happened? Yes. He got up into the driver's compartment. He had nothing on his legs or in his hand when he took out across the cow pasture. 
Obviously, law enforcement started pulling out all of the resources to catch him. Helicopters, horses, search parties, you know, you name it. The very next day, the 14th, a $50,000 reward was up for grabs, and over 300 law enforcement officers were on the hunt for him. For the first time, we're getting a better idea of what's happening inside that five square mile search area in western Leon County. This video given to us today by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice shows the hundreds of officers who have been marching through the brush acre by acre and the pop-up city that sprung up on the cow pastures in and around Centerville. But so far, every possible hiding spot has come up empty. Right now, every indication we have is that he's still out here. TDCJ spokesman Robert Hurst shared newly released images of escaped inmate Gonzalo Lopez. They were taken by surveillance cameras shortly before he boarded the prison transport bus last Thursday. Yeah, I've had a lot of people comment, you know, that he's got a smirk on his face, so who knows what he was thinking. It is still unknown if Lopez brought anything onto the bus that may have assisted his escape. The proper protocol is for an inmate to be searched before they get onto a transport bus. That'll be part of our investigation to find out if protocol was followed in what was supposed to be done. How the convicted killer for the cartel managed to shed his shackles, cut through a metal barrier, stab a prison bus driver, and ultimately get away is still a mystery, Hearst says. That's part of our ongoing investigation is to find out exactly how he did it and why it was not noticeable. We're going to be turning over every possibility to find out what it was that he did and how he did it. And they continued searching, but there was no sign of him for nearly two weeks until June 2nd, just earlier this month. So now let's pause and switch gears for a minute to discuss Mark Collins and his grandsons and what they were doing as all of this was underway. On the morning of Thursday, June 2nd, Mark Collins took his four grandsons up to his ranch for a summer vacation weekend. Wylan, who was 18 years old, Carson, who's 16 years old, and Hudson, 11 years old, were brothers, and Bryson, who is also 11 years old, was their cousin. The family was well known and very much loved in their community, and the boys were all into sports and they had big plans for this weekend, plans that included recreational shooting on the property, boating, fishing, I mean, you name it, creating summer memories that would last a lifetime. And Mark was aware that an inmate was on the loose and had actually even spoken to law enforcement several times about it. According to their family friend, he had even let law enforcement search his ranch in case they could find anything there or find Gonzalo. There had also apparently been a burglary at the neighbor's house two days prior, and Gonzalo was a possible suspect in this burglary at the time. So it was very possible that Gonzalo was nearby, However, it's unclear whether Mark knew about that burglary happening and the possibility of Gonzalo being so close to his house. And those close to Mark say he would have never gone up to the ranch, especially with his grandkids, had he known what had happened at the neighbor's house or had he truly thought that there was a potential threat of danger. And in fact, that afternoon, DNA had come back linking Gonzalo to the burglary that happened at the neighbor's house but it's unclear if that was made public right away that afternoon or not. So later that evening, on the same day that Mark and the boys headed up to the ranch for their vacation and fun plans for the weekend, a family member called in for a wellness check on Mark and the boys because they had been unable to get a hold of Mark or any of the boys for hours. When officers got to the property, it was immediately evident that foul play was involved. Mark, Waylon, Carson, Hudson, and Bryson were no longer alive. All five of them were brutally murdered. And in addition to that, the house appeared to have been ransacked. Things like clothes and weapons were completely missing from the home. But the biggest giveaway was that the ranch truck was also missing, meaning that the suspect most likely didn't have their own means of transportation and needed a getaway vehicle, which would of course then lead you to believe, okay, the likelihood of this being Gonzalo now is even, you know, is even bigger. So later that evening, a truck matching the description was spotted over 250 miles away from the house near North Star Mall in San Antonio. Officers followed this truck and followed Gonzalo, but they didn't follow too close because they didn't want to tip him off. They ended up putting down a spike strip, but he kept on driving and he led them on once again, a car chase. And as he was leading them on this car chase, he was literally hanging out of the window with his rifle shooting 
out the window at the police. Ultimately, he crashed into a telephone pole, but then continued on driving before crashing into another one. Once he had crashed again, he got out and began shooting at the officers. At this point, he had nothing left to lose, nowhere else to go, and he just kept firing. He left officers no choice but to shoot and kill him. His route showed that he was most likely headed to Mexico, and when they found him, he was found with an AR-15 type rifle and a pistol that he had stolen from Mark's home. His life ended after he ended the lives of five innocent people, four of them being children. While it seemed like an absolute necessity to shoot him and ultimately kill him because he was shooting at the officers, I can't help but feel horrible for the Collins family. Because now five people are gone, and there are bound to be many, many more questions left unanswered for this poor family. Questions that only the family members who are now deceased or Gonzalo would have the answers to. It's unclear whether this was an ambush in this house or if Gonzalo had actually been staying at the cabin prior and when the family arrived, it spooked him and then he attacked them. A family friend and the family's pastor held a press conference on the very next day on June 3rd. Thank you, Andy. Uh, My name is David Crane, C-R-A-I-N, and as Andy said, I've been a long-time friend of the Collins, and uh, I've been also a long-time law enforcement officer. I've seen a lot, just like Andy, and what has happened to the Collins family is just unspeakable. Uh, those, Those kids were bright, shining stars. We coached them through baseball. And these next few days are going to be tough on all of us. And we, <clears throat> we just really ask you all to respect uh, what the family's going through, what we're all going through, and uh, give us that time to grieve. And, uh, I mean, e- even the, the hardest of the hard, this is, this is very difficult to take. And, uh, but we'll get through it. And we also respect the Rangers. Uh, their investigation is still ongoing. Um, I've been in communication with the Rangers. They've been nothing but, but first class, as they always are. Uh, and I know that uh, as, as the days go on, we're going to find out more about what happened and why it happened. And, and, and then if, if you know, steps can be take, taken to make sure it doesn't happen again, then that's where we go. But in the meantime, I just want everybody to remember the Collins boys. They're, the, the whole community here has suffered a loss. That's a long history here. You know them personally. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, as I already mentioned, it's just a, a family of deep faith. But I think that one of the things that everyone here would speak to is it's a very close-knit family. It's a large family, multiple siblings, multiple generations. In fact, uh, uh, the great-grandfather of the family uh, was a member here as well. Uh, and so, or, and still is rather. And, and I just think that, that the close knit nature of the family is what makes this so incredibly devastating, but also is something that is beautiful to watch because they have such a strong support system. The kids were very involved in sports, you know, baseball, football activities, as you already just heard from David, uh, they're incredibly active in the community, very well known here, very well beloved here. And so the outpouring of support from the community is not simply in response to the tragedy, but it's actually in response to the fact that they are just loved people in the community. The autopsy results were released on June 9th, and the Collins family had died of homicide by gunshot and stab wounds. Just a horribly sad and angering situation all around. Now here's what's very interesting. State Senator John Whitemire has been very critical of this horrible tragedy, and he recently said that there is a high, high possibility, that is a direct quote, that this was an inside job. I'm sorry, what? An inside job? What, like, what are you talking about? He said that Gonzalo had a key and a knife, so whoever had patted him down before entering that bus completely failed. Failed on accident or failed intentionally? And he claimed they haven't found it, but the authorities are speculating that another inmate got the key, which is very scary. 
Whitemire believes that some of the inmates will probably also get charged due to their involvement in distracting the guards on the bus and creating all that chaos to where ultimately then the bus, you know, was overtaken by the prisoners and Gonzalo was able to escape. And they absolutely should be charged because had there not been this distraction on that bus, five innocent people, four of them being children, may very well still be alive. Texas has currently stopped all inmate transfers while this investigation is underway. And while we don't know the exact events leading up to his escape, it seems very clear that at least some protocols were for sure messed up along the way, and that that is the reason that this horrible mass slaying happened. And if the state senator is saying he believes that it is a high, high probability that this was an inside job, that would mean that an officer helped him escape or was trying to give him the means to escape, giving, putting a key on his person, letting him, you know, board the bus with a knife to defend himself or to overpower somebody, whatever it may, whatever the plan was going to be, should uh, the inmates have not helped him kind of rile everybody up. But he's alluding that somebody in power and in position helped him. Now, as this investigation continues, I'm going to be very eager to see if that is in fact true. Because if that is the case, that means that that officer will absolutely have to be held accountable. And while the Collins family can't get justice for the family members by going after Gonzalo himself because he is now deceased, at least they will have somebody facing some sort of accountability so they can get justice for their family members. But even so, it still is just such a sen senseless tragedy. The justice doesn't even feel like enough in this case because it could have been avoided. These five people's lives did not have to end. There are different stops, in my opinion, along the timeline of events that took place where this could have been prevented. Not only if the guard didn't help him out or, you know, help him escape, if that is in fact true, but also when the DNA came back that the burglary at the neighbor's house was in fact Gonzalo. They should have not only made that public right away, but they should have alerted all of the nearby neighbors. And had they done that in a timely manner, it's my belief that perhaps maybe Mark wouldn't have gone up there with the kids unless he was already up there. I mean, we need to get this timeline exactly situated. And they are being very vague on details right now. And my gut is telling me it's because they're trying to cover some asses. Personally, that's just my opinion, all right? Well, scold me in the comments, whatever. But that's truly what I believe. I think once we actually get a true definitive timeline, it's going to become clear where the missteps happen along the way. Because again, in my gut and based on everything that I've seen and that I've read and that I'm hearing and digging on and things like that, I think this could have been avoided several different times at several different points. But I am interested to know your thoughts on this case below. It is an absolute tragedy, but as I stated in the beginning, it's one that is not only sad, but very angering because I don't think it needed to happen. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Do you think a guard did, in fact, help Gonzalo and allowed him to board the bus with a knife on his person, a key on his person, and aid in his escape? Do you think that when he got to the family's ranch home, the boys and Mark were already inside, and so he blitz attacked them? Do you think that he had already been camped out and staying at that cabin, or the ranch home, I should say, and then when they all came up for the vacation, it startled him, and then he attacked them? Because again, going back to getting that definitive timeline, we know that Mark had suggested or offered and allowed law enforcement to search his property. When did that happen? Because depending on when, what day and what time that happened, that would also help build the timeline to know if he truly, if Gonzalo truly was staying in the house and then the family arrived or if he came to the house after the fact. So let me know what you guys think and what your theories are in the comments below. I'm interested to hear from you and I'm going to follow this again closely because I just, I, I need to know those timestamps. I need to know what exactly happens as we piece this together. So again, make sure you're subscribed if you're not already so that you get notified when I come back on here with those updates and once we know more in this case. But in the meantime, please leave your supportive comments and well wishes for the Collins family below. I just can't even begin to imagine the heartbreak and devastation that that family is dealing with right now. And so as much support and well wishes and love and, you know, empathy we can 
provide for them, I think all the better. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in with me today on today's case. And until the next one, stay safe.